Now we had to um, innovate slightly and get an extra couple of seats on the stage because the conversation was going so well we thought it was better to have the whole panel up here. So sitting in the um, temporary theatre, we had to break the theatre to make it happen. Um, sitting in the uh, temporary seat over there is Richard Peebles who is of course um, a prominent uh, central city developer. And I've got a bit of a bone to pick with Richard. I've been to the Little High Eatery three times and got a seat once. <laughs> So it's an indication of just how well that's going, a fantastic um, piece of innovative work that has opened recently in the central city, uh, among the many high profile developments that Richard has done. Um, and also welcome to the stage Malcolm Johns, seated in the middle, um, who is of course Chief Executive of Christchurch International Airport, and is, dry, I think it's fair to say, driving a great many high quality conversations within the city about where we want to be and, and uh, what we're doing to achieve it. Uh, so welcome to you both. Now we are a little pressured for time this evening because a great many of you want to get to the Arts Fest launch later this evening, uh, which will also be a fantastic event in the city calendar. Uh, so we will try and get through as many questions as we can. You're welcome to stay and network afterwards if you're not going on, on elsewhere, um, or we will be picking these conversations back up in future forums. So before the break, we started on that thorny question of vision. Do we need a vision? Do we have one? And if so, what is it? What should it be? Now in the break, you would have seen um, the Christchurch story playing there, which was a piece of work that the, the Christchurch Airport um, initiated, which was a really strong starting point for the conversation. So I'm going to throw first to to Malcolm. Malcolm, do we need a city vision? And if so, what should it be? Well, the city needs a central organising thing, whether it's a vision, a hallucination, call it whatever you want. Um, but you need you need a, you need a central organising thing. But it can't be claustrophobic and it can't be oppressive. And so the piece of work that we did last year really was just a research piece. We had a hypothesis that a number of conversations we'd been invited to be part of uh, were bogged down in this small bit of differentiation. Uh, and so we believe that uh, the vast majority of people uh, in the city actually knew what they wanted their city to be. Um, but there was this uh, intimidation of because we had to create something completely new, uh, that you had to sort of abandon that, 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 that feeling that you knew what you wanted. And so we did this piece of research where we interviewed a, a broad range of uh, city leaders and we reviewed the Share an Idea campaign, which was absolutely an outstanding source of rich material. Uh, and, the, and the film that you saw is a reflection of that research. And our hypothesis was confirmed that the vast majority of people in Christchurch actually know what they want their city to be. And fundamentally, it's pretty similar to what it was before, just with some, some new additions to it. Uh, and you can kind of look at it like this. Cities are basically have three ingredients. They have the physical place, they have the people that live there, and they have the things that emotionally connect the two together. So quite naturally in Christchurch, when the place got disrupted significantly, people became disorientated in terms of how they attached to the city. And what you're getting now in the CBD is a fundamentally different looking city. So the, the challenge, the leadership challenge here is how do you get the old heart of Christchurch to think inside its new skin? Uh, and until you can do that, people won't emotionally connect to the city. And unless you can emotionally connect people to the city, you'll never get a central organising thing that everyone can fly in formation behind. I love that. Old heart beating within. Richard, is it Garden City? Is that the old heart and the new skin? Um, I'm probably not the man to ask for that. About uh, branding and marketing, but does the city need a, a brand and a, and a but um, you know I think the city's probably more important is to, is to get these these um, anchor projects done to get to get the our farmers market done, and I think all those sorts of things will get that that heart back into the city. Now whether we spend a quarter of a million dollars on doing a brand, I'm not sure that's probably a great idea, but um, you know we're the garden city, maybe we should be again. It's certainly got some resonance with the crowd. Um, so that's a really good point. This isn't just about a slogan, is it? What, what is it that contributes to a sense of place within the city? I wonder if Leanne, you want to address that? Well, I, I always reflect on the Garden City because when I was running for mayor, people 
were saying to me that they were a little bit worried that we were not going to be the garden city anymore. But what a garden city means in the 21st century is something quite different from what it meant um, in the century before. So I, I actually think that when you talk about a garden city, you can be talking about sustainability, you can be talking about um, all of the, you know, you can talk about food resilience, you can talk about um, all sorts of um, elements of, of city living that embraces the, the, the natural environment. So, you know, I, I think it's, it, it, it is entirely appropriate, but this is why we've kind of, as a city council, adopted the city of opportunity, because again, it's a journey that we're on. And I don't think that we yet know what we're going to be, but Malcolm really nailed it, I thought, was saying you've got to have that emotional connection. Uh, my emotional connection comes from the fact that I was born here and lived here all my life, but um, we haven't convinced Malcolm yet because he was born up north. Maybe. I was born elsewhere, so you can't convince me to be born here anymore. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> He's always one for detail. Emotional. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well. Is that enough? Not. <laughs> I, I, I have to say something. Yep. I think um, what I think the fact that we've had such a big change in our city, we're thinking differently, and I think that's really important. Um, yes, we've got new buildings and things like that, but the fact that we're thinking in a different way is really. Uh, it is what will make the difference to the city in the long term. And I love the fact that the city's been turned the other way around. And now we're facing the river. And now we're redeveloping that area as a people-friendly space that people can gather in. And as we deliver, develop the residential red zone, that people-friendly space in the centre of our city can go all the way from Hagley Park right to the sea. And I think that's going to change the way we live. Everybody in the city will have an opportunity to get into the outdoors, to get into the green space, to enjoy that space, not very far away from home. Well, on that point, Minister, what, what is your vision for the red zone regeneration? What would you like to see happen there? What I would really like to see, I'm just thinking of how to put that. What I would really like to see is an opportunity for the people of Christchurch to interact and engage in that area. Um, what we know is that um, open spaces, green spaces, are good for us. They're good for us emotionally, they're good for us physically to get out and do that. So what that actually looks like it's not that important to me. It's what people will feel that they can get involved with, what people will feel is important for them. Okay, so that's reasonably non-specific. Does anyone want to throw some specifics into a match for what their vision for uh, the residential red zone is? Anyone in the crowd is free to also. <laughs> I'd, love, I'd love to see you know, the, the red zone, the connection of the city to the, to the sea. I could see a walkway from the city to the sea, the green, the, the forest areas, people have been talking about cycle lanes not on roads, actually through the red zone to the sea, so instead of taking up car parks and narrowing roads, we put it through the green space. But also, I'd love to see that international rowing course and the white water course, you know, and I know there's talk about lots of money, but I'd imagine if you the two or three hundred sections along the rowing course, you might actually pay for the rowing course and the white water course and possibly the forest and the walkways and the cycle lanes. But um, that's what I'd love to see is a, in that red zone connecting onto the city. Anyone else care to throw anything to the mix of the residential red zone? Oh, well, I'll throw something in. Um, and you mentioned it there about connection, and I think for everybody in this city, um, having a connection somehow ties you to the place. And whatever the red zone looks like, uh, those who have been here forever, the community and everyone else, working together to work out what that, that looks like, whether it's a white water rafting, flat water facility, but obviously it's something where people can connect with the land and the place. Uh, and that we can tell our story because what I think part of the opportunity from the earthquakes are that we're basically starting from the ground up. We will get to tell our story, so Naita who can tell their story and uh, those visitors who came after can tell their story and we can, we can create a whole new vision for the city and we can look to the past but not let us hamper us, but we can acknowledge that it's there 
and we can um, after the earthquakes people learned about those what they call them the black maps the reasons why we didn't build the reasons why some of the houses ended up the way they were this is part of the story of who we are now so we can tell that story and I think it will be for the future I think that's a great thing it connects us I've got one bit I'd like to share which was um a year or two ago, I did some travelling around America and visited the dead cities. Uh, the Denvers, the Detroits, the, the ones that were now, you know, a fifth of the size that they used to be. And the key really was, you know, opportunity. At the end of the day, we're, most of us still have to buy food, pay mortgages, etc. And when, when the economy uh, struggles, people leave. So what I would like to see moving forward is this connection between business, education and government to, to really drive um, not just the vision, as you say, not just the marketing campaign, but activity that encourages people to look at Christchurch and go, is this real X, Y, Z happening? And I reflect on something some of the guys at Google said to me once, which is, we're not going to come here for the mountains. You know, we're not here for the beaches. We're here for opportunity, talent and to make things. So you've got to prove you're worth it. And I think that's another opportunity we can do because what we learn with, with Epic and things is, is physical proximity is important. You put brilliant people together, great things happen. So my desire for the city, and I don't have the answer, is you know, what are the great things that are going to attract these people? How do we, how do we make them real? Because then we'll have something truly unique. Mm -hmm. So that connection between business, government and education, can any of our panellists suggest a real vehicle for meaningful connections that actually have a tangible benefit such as that that Will suggests? Well I don't think that you can ignore the environment though because I mean people want to live in a place that Absolutely they are able to do stuff in you know <coughs> and um, I mean um, I'd be gobsmacked if Google Google staff members weren't interested in, in um, some, oh, <laughs> some of the great wrong. outdoors people, people are, absolutely, but the world's full of beautiful places. Yes, I, I recognise that, but in a post-disaster environment, there is something about the opportunity that everyone knows exists in such a space uh, that will enable, as long as we enable it, are enabling in terms of bringing people here, I mean, I was talking to, um, the part of the share and idea was an international speaker series and uh, one of the speakers who come from Harvard, he said that their graduate placement or location after they graduated had gone, um, had shown that graduates went to New Orleans after Katrina. They went, before Katrina, they were num New Orleans was number 25 on the list, after Katrina it was number four and it was because of that sense of opportunity and actually being in there on the ground as the recovery um, progressed. So I think we should be building on that to a certain degree as well. I agree. And similarly, I would suggest, um, we talked about the red zone, I know this is about the central city, but the red zone offers the opportunity in an environmental space to create some innovation mm. and you know, work around that. I think one of the things that, that is attractive about a city post a disaster is that it seems like anything can happen, that there's opportunity to do new things, that possibilities happen. And I think we've got to be very careful that we don't shut that down as the time co progresses. And I keep thinking of the trees that are opposite C1 in the Innovation Precinct. They were made out of wood from a residential red zone. Um, somebody, I think Joe um, from Brown Breed, ran council and said, can we put this uh, public sculpture up? Would someone like to build it? Yes, we will. They had a bit of fundraising, for crowd fundraising, and there it was. And how often anywhere in the world can you put a, a sculpture up there just like that? And it's that sort of idea of possibilities that someone can come up with a good idea and it will be embraced is something that I think we want to hold on to. So I think that's a great point, Nikki. You're absolutely right that that was a crowd, the Reagan Gentry sculptures were crowdfunded and crowd supported. To what extent has council and government facilitated that kind of approach where innovation is possible? Well, I think, from private I think one of the issues with government and councils is that we t tend often to shut things down rather than open things up. And certainly in this city, if we could be much more flexible to open things, it would add enormous value. 
think before, before my time, I think the council took absolutely the right approach, which was to actually engage the community directly in um, enlivening all of those spaces. So uh, life and vacant spaces became almost like a community broker uh, with uh, private and public land available to gap filler and green in the rubble and wonderful community-led organisations like that. And I think you know, that sort of um, initiative and, uh, and, and engagement of people in, in, in testing and, and just trialling things and doing stuff, um, that's the, absolutely the way to get innovation happening in a central city. And that's what, the, that's what all of those overseas publications noticed about Christchurch in the immediate aftermath. Joe, so, so, you've got a question. Oh, have we? Um, so the innovation the I'll ask a question um, that follows on while we get the mic to see. Um, one person who is, of course, doing a lot of private work um, is Richard. Richard, can you tell us a little bit about the farmer's market concept and why you think it's will work for Christchurch? Okay, well, the, the farmer's market concept was um, basically came, came around because I, I just love markets. <laughs> and I go around the world and I always want to go to the local markets. And I did a bit of research about the markets. And all around the world, they're bringing these markets back into the CBD proper. I mean, the prime retail area. It's not, a, it's not just what we're doing here, but they're doing it around the world. And um, I recognised that we had this block of land. Um, Otakaro or Sarah had the block of land. And initially, Sarah wasn't terribly um, encouraging, but I persevered and I think over a several months I, I spent a bit of money doing some proposals and um, I met with um, Keith and Albert, Albert Brantley and um, when, I, when I actually got, finally got to see Albert, um, he got it straight away. He talked about a market that he had been, his favourite market I think was in Canada and, and he understood the concept. Now that, you know, years ago the, um, the market used to be the heart of a town you know, I think our market will be the heart of the town again. It's, it's, it's primarily for small businesses. You know, it's the local fresh produce. It's a food market. It's not an arts and craft market. We're hoping to uh, have a, uh, sorry, a weekend arts and craft market and so on the promenade that the um, Otaka are kindly doing for us now. Um, we're, we're trying to do a laneway connecting our farmer's market right through to Ballantyne's and the farmer's, farm, uh, sorry, the, um, the council car park building. And Ballantines, so we're trying to connect the, um, you know, the, the, the east-west connection all the way through with courtyards and laneways. You know, one of the the, the anchor projects is this, the, the courtyards and laneways. And out of all of the the, the, the the things they're doing, I think the laneways and the courtyards is the one that's going to change the city the most. So we really want to get that connection from Cashel Mall right through to Litchfield Street and the Justice Precinct. There's 2,000 people a day, I think, in the Justice Precinct. We've got something like 80,000 workers within 300 metres of this farmer's market. What we're trying to achieve is we pro provide an avenue for the local small producers to better sell their product direct to um, the, the local office workers and we get them in the habit of coming in. We're having a um, bakery, a fishmonger, we're having a delicatessen, um, fruit and veggies, plus the small local, local um, producers. But also we've got 32 small food operators, and all the guys from Little High Eatery are coming into the farmer's market. So it'll be 32 small um, foodies, HOSPO, very small ones like Little High, uh, plus about 45 schools, 32, 30 odd shops, um, and obviously those um, bakery delis and all that, the main, the main guys in there. So, and we've got the, the West Basin, we're engaging with the river. I think um, you said, Nicky, about engaging with the river. We've got this beautiful promenade area which faces west, gets all the afternoon sun, and you've got Friendship Park with the council are going to let us utilise the tables and chairs and bean bags and that sort of thing to engage with the market. But what we're also hoping to do is get all these all these functions that were in Hadley Park, the Lantern Festival, the New York Festival. Lantern Festival, I think had seventy five thousand people over three or four nights. We want to bring those back in onto that promenade area along the river. Um, so just so that area the huge public open space of the Bridge of Remembrance and the promenade in front of Anthony Goff's development. We want to use that for all of those sort of functions and with the, the farmer's market being the heart. That's great. Thank you for that.
Uh, thank you very much. Um, to the Minister, uh, what commitment can you give to transparency um, regarding the long-term financial viability of the Christchurch Convention Centre that's planned um, and the decisions that are currently guiding the project? Um, you've talked about openness and collaboration and transparency. Um, and could you um, agree to sharing that business case with the Council, even if it's publicly excluded? And then my question to the panel would be is, um, should we uh, be bound by the blueprint? Bound by the blueprint. Bound by the blueprint. What was it? Sorry, I missed the last question. Okay. The, the question to the panel is, uh, should we be bound to the, to the blueprint? But the, minister, the, uh, the question to the minister is regarding transparency of the yeah, business I, I case. Heard that. What was the last question? Should we be bound by the blueprint? The blueprint. Oh, the blueprint. Okay. Um, yes, I think we should be bound by the blueprint. The reason I think we should be bound by it is that when it was introduced, it was um, a plan that people could make their plans around. So, for example, people like Richard, um, people who've developed things in the city, know where everything's going to be. Now, the convention centre it has begun, and we're working our way through that process, and it will all come out and be transparent in the long term. Um, but I think the blueprint may not be perfect, but at least it's something that we know where we're going and we know what we're going to deliver. One of the issues we've seen internationally is if you set up a plan and you don't stick to that plan, it, and it goes round and round and round, and that's what's happened in New Orleans. It's just nothing but um, it, make, it makes everything longer and worse. Uh, just a, a follow-up question. Just incidentally, what is the barrier to transparency in the short term? Uh, well, I, I don't think there's a lot of barriers to transparency, but at the moment we're just finalising um, the outcome of the tenders for the, con the Convention Centre, and once that's done, you'll be able to see evil. Jo, can I just make some general comments yeah. on that? Um, you have two types of citizens in a city. You have permanent citizens and you have temporary citizens. And temporary citizens are visitors to your city. And uh, the, the city should not overlook the power of temporary citizens for a number of reasons. First of all, a visitor to this city spends six times as much per day as a permanent resident does. Before the earthquake, there was on average 15,000 temporary citizens in our CBD every night. After the earthquake, that dropped to about 3,000. A third of all the hospitality business in this city comes from temporary residents. This city is the biggest single investor in tourism in the South Island. It has $800 million invested in the airport, and the airport runs entirely on tourism. And the airport pays $35 million worth of dividends a year. So if you think that tourism isn't relevant to the city, or the infrastructure that underpins visitation to the city isn't relevant, you're kidding yourself because it's, it's one of the biggest sectors in the city, and the city is already enormously invested in it. So the Metro Sports Facility, the Convention Centre, the multi-use arena, etc., they are all critical to rehabilitating the CBD. So I think that to, take, to pick one project and look at it in isolation uh, doesn't work, because you take Tomatatini, which we hosted here uh, two years ago, I think, 30,000 visitors to the city. Those are all really critical components of the social and economic well-being of the, of the city. So I think that we've got to be really careful that we don't just focus on a building or a particular dimension of the visitor sector, because it underpins so much of our CBD, so much of our employment in the city, and so much of what the city's already got invested. Topic here, and I wonder if it's time for just a quick update on the anchor projects because, um, as we know, they are important to the development of the city. I wonder if any of our panelists can give us an update on the performing arts present. Nikki or oh yeah. Well, we could talk about that together. Um, the Performing Arts Precinct, of course, is the section between, let me get this right, Gloucester and Arma Streets um, on Colombo Street. Um, at one end of it, there's this building, the piano, and behind us is the Isaac Theatre Royal, and on the corner is the hotel that's being redeveloped. Uh, the rest of the land um, is owned by Portacaro, owned by the Crown. 
there's two more sites that well, are still being negotiated. <laughs> oh, you can announce, can you? Yeah. It's very close. <laughs> um, anyway, head along to all the land will be owned by um, the Crown, and the Crown is putting that towards the Performing Arts Precinct. Um, the council has also put some funding into that area and are negotiating with tents in that space. Do you want to add? So um, it, it's been a particularly challenging one because um, it's, uh, there has been a sort of a, a lack of agreement through the process as to who, who was going to lead the project. Um, a, a decision was taken part way through uh, the process. In fact, shortly after I became mayor, it was decided that it would be a joint effort rather than one led by the council. So um, the issue is how do we make the uh, community um, performing arts organisations that will be based in the performing arts precinct, how do we make them sustainable? And part of the thinking that's been going on in this area is, is to take the land ownership and to transfer it to a trust. And the trust then is able to generate um, income to support the, um, particularly uh, in this instance, the court theatre. The arrangements that were made for the piano were actually quite distinct from the balance of precinct. And um, I never quite understood why that was the case. But as I say, a lot of this happened across um, you know, me becoming the mayor and, and afterwards. So rather than looking backwards, in terms of forwards, uh, we have been working very closely, as I understand it, as an organisation, particularly with the Court Theatre, about the um, nature of the Court Theatre rebuild. They are absolutely committed to coming back into the CBD. We are absolutely determined that we want them back in the CBD because it would just make a huge difference. But the, the, the scale of what is built and, and then how, what else we build on this area. I mean, one of the things that we're looking at is a car park building. Um, now, car park buildings may not be forever required and in the life of that building, needs may change. So we're thinking about if we're building a car park building, um, should it be built in such a way that it could later be turned into apartments or um, office space? So we're working through all of those issues. A lot of that's confidential at the moment. So we're not, we're not going through all of the, the details of the discussions that we're having with the court theatre. Um, and so as soon as we're in a position to um, you know, make a decision as a council, that will certainly be in the public arena. It's an enormously uh, interesting update. Thank you for, to both of you. Um, so Metro Sport is the other one where um, communities are waiting an update of sorts. Are you in a position to give us a similarly transparent update on that? Well, the, yes. the Otakura is leading the, the work yes. on it, but obviously we are deeply engaged because in this particular instance, this is a facility that will be owned by the city um, and operated by the city, uh, um, but it is being built uh, by Otakura. And um, we have done started work on it. You would have seen um, the space it's the, on the old brewery site, and um, we are very close to announcing who will be the lead contractor going forward. Again, can I mention something on that? You know, we, we spoke about uh, connections and ambitions before, etc. Um, uh, the, the facilities like the Metro Sports allow our community to connect to the rest of New Zealand and beyond. So right now, as a city, we can't host the National Swimming Champs because we don't have a pool. We can't host a National Netball Champs because we don't have indoor courts. So our competitive set as a city is Napier and Palmerston North uh, and uh, uh, New Plymouth, although Napier and Palmerston North, sorry, Napier and New Plymouth can host rugby tests. So, you know, it does cut to how the level of ambition you want in the community and how much you're going to allow your community to connect to the rest of New Zealand. So these facilities are really, really important, not only to connect within our community, but to connect within our country and beyond as well. So again, if you look at them in isolation as pure standalone debates, the context is wrong because the context is a city without ambition, if that's the conversation. 
and the context of these conversations for Christchurch for the next three years are really, really critical. The next three years in Christchurch are the Goldilocks years. That's when all of the physical infrastructure that everyone expected in the first three or four years after the earthquake is going to come into being. And if the context of our conversation is, is a downward or negative spiral, then we're not going to make the most of that opportunity. The context is about how we as a community connect within ourselves and connect within New Zealand off the back of these anchor projects. Well, I'm no marketeer, but City Without Ambition doesn't uh, play all that well with me. Uh, have you got some questions? Gary? Nikki, I was attracted to your concept of openness. Um, thinking about the blueprint, uh, 100 days it took to prepare, uh, we were 17 times that with not a lot happening since. And picking up what Malcolm said last, what if an idea came forward that connected the convention centre and the stadium and came up with an idea that may even cost less so we get something that isn't two white elephants but becomes something that is quite exciting, innovative and new? If that came in front of you, would you look at it? Well, I'm always keen to look at new ideas, but of course the Convention Centre has already begun to be built. Um, the groundworks have been done and the uh, tender is very close to being let. So you'd have to be pretty quick. But you would consider it? I always consider everything. Got some questions up the top here? Yeah. yeah. Um, so. I, I don't know about anybody else, but I've got the feeling in this room there's not just one elephant, but there's quite a few. A bit of a herd of elephants sitting there, quite silent, you know. And not white elephants necessarily, Gary, but... Um, my question about uh, the Accessible City Anchor Project, is that a, a fast failure or slow success? Or both. Uh, well, look, most people don't understand what an accessible city is. It is a chapter in the Central City Recovery Plan. So the Christchurch City Council developed a draft recovery plan and submitted it to the government. But two or three months later, that's what triggered the 100-day blueprint process. So it, 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 what, what, what the city handed over was the ambition for the city. It included um, a number of the, 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 um, the assets, really, for the city that are part of the blueprint. All the blueprint did was rejiggle it and create the basis for the, the cost-sharing agreement. Um, and an accessible city uh, and, uh, and sometimes you, you pass legislation, and it has what a, uh, politicians always hate uh, reference to unintended consequences. But one of the changes from the Recovery Act to the Regeneration Act was that it said that there were certain, recover, certain um, recovery plans that could not be amended without a regeneration plan. And the Central City Recovery Plan is one of those. And an accessible city is a chapter of that recovery plan. So we are now working incredibly hard to make design changes that actually benefit everyone, that support the underlying principles without having to do a regeneration plan. So we're working together to try and get a simple resolution that will enable an accessible city to meet its objectives, which is to make the central city accessible for everyone. Thank you, Leanne. Now, look, we've got time for one last question before uh, some of you may need to get away. Uh, just at the top there. Yeah, uh, Leanne, you talk about the importance of resilience at the start, you mentioned um, climate change. With uh, a metre of sea level rise predicted over the next 80 years, how much of Christchurch is going to be affected by that, and, and what are you doing today to prepare or mitigate for that? Yeah, the, the, um, uh, that was an, a, an earlier question we had on, on um, the, the, the vulnerability that, that we have as a, as a coastal city. 
um, in terms of the work that we have to do on the coastal hazards chapter of the district plan. So that is work that is still in progress. We have to actually have a really a, a serious conversation, not only with our coastal communities, but also with the rest of the city about what the options are to address what is future risk. We have people living in coastal environments at the moment, and uh, those, um, those are, are perfectly valid um, options at the moment, but what, will that change in the future? It depends what part of the coastline that you're talking about, and it depends on what defences are able to be, um, uh, uh, well, what defences exist and what could exist. So there's a lot of work to be done in that space, and I think it could it could require a you know a seminar of this nature, um, but but probably not of this nature, but a more um, in-depth seminar with um, some experts providing some advice, because it won't just be a question of those who live in those environments, because there will be costs associated with any of the decisions that are made. So we actually have to have a wider conversation with the Christchurch community, but that's going to take place over the next couple of years. Thank you, Ian. Well, look, I think on those words, a wider conversation with the Christchurch community, I feel today we've really only started to scratch the surface, but one of those themes that came through almost every answer and every question is the need to continue to involve the people of Christchurch in this recovery. So I am going to now thank our panellists and invite uh, Nikki and Leanne to share some final words. As I say, do feel free to stay and network afterwards or, or to move away if you need to. Uh, again, thank you to Renee and everybody who has supported her to make this happen today. To all of you who have taken some time out of very, very busy schedules to get involved in this conversation. And to our panellists, Richard, Lauren, Will, Robin, Malcolm, Leanne and Nikki, thank you very, very much for your time. It's been very, very valuable from my point of view and I'm sure for the audiences. So please join me now in thanking our panel for Thank you for coming today. I think you're right, we've only scratched the surface, but I do think there's themes coming through this discussion. And the themes are about um, working together, thinking differently, taking up opportunities, making sure that the city provides a a good place to live, to work, to play, and particularly for families. My particular interest in, is in the next generation coming through, that we make sure that we can provide a quality of life, a place that they can engage with, that they can feel is a home for them, opportunities for education, for training, and so that they can stay in the city. One of the reasons that I got involved in politics was I saw uh, people leaving our city in droves around the turn of the century. And I think um, what we see today in our city, how we've worked through some of the issues that have happened since the earthquake have made us a stronger, more thoughtful, and a better community. And I look forward to working with all of you to carry that forward. Kia ora. After I got elected as mayor, I um, arranged for a recovery forum to start a conversation with communities about elements of recovery and how we engage communities in every aspect of our recovery journey. Um, shortly afterwards, I was invited by the then Minister for Earthquake Recovery to join him uh, on the stage out at uh, the Aurora Centre in Burnside, and I think that was back in November 2013. Uh, we stood alongside each other and I, I, the reason I accepted the invitation was because I thought it sent a really powerful message for the Minister and the Mayor to stand alongside each other um, speaking about the need to work collaboratively and to consider all elements of the community when thinking about the future of our city. Um, Minister Wagner has only been in the role for um, a matter of weeks and for her this was a priority not just to do it once, but actually to do this as an ongoing conversation with our community and actually to have the capacity to break off into smaller groups and deal with um, particular communities that want to address particular issues. 
What has been helpful for me today is, is actually really hearing some of the questions that people are raising. They are issues that are really important to um, our city. Uh, resilience and the sustainability issues, climate change, um, all of those issues are absolutely vital and we do need to take a leadership role that does mean that we have to look at the nature of the um, challenges that our city faces, uh, what are the natural hazards that are uh, relevant to our particular area and what are we going to do as a city to address all of those. Um, I've taken uh, considerable heart from the fact that we can do a lot more if we do that together. Um, I just want to conclude by thanking all of the people who came and contributed. I, I think they didn't really know necessarily uh, that they were going to be uh, put on the spot, but what they've done is that they've actually also um, enabled a bigger conversation to start happening. We will be back, we're going to be talking about um, the regeneration ecosystem but in the future, we also need to be talking about the health and well-being of our community. We need to be talking about those sustainability issues in the coastal environments that we um, that we inhabit uh, in a city like Christchurch. Um, and then longer term, uh, Regenerate Christchurch will be leading a conversation about the future of the residential red zone. So thank you all, each and every one of you, for turning up. Um, and I look forward to being part of the future conversations. Okay, well I'd like to say thank you again to our panellists, to our Minister and our Mayor, and I'd like to get you to join me in thanking our facilitator, Joanna Norris. I'd also like to thank you as an audience for the respect that you have shown to our panellists today. We know there's some topics that get people a little bit hot under the collar, and we do really want to address those. So we do have a date for our next forum, which will be about the regeneration ecosystem, and that's July the 31st. It's a Monday, it will be at the same venue, and we will send the invites out to that shortly, but you can put that date into your diary. As I said in opening, we are all here because we are leaders, and I think there were several invitations given to us today. I liked when Will mentioned that people talked good and then left, and I think it's really important for us as leaders that we don't engage in a conversation and then drop out of that conversation. And if I reflect on the role that some of us have played, we were very engaged to begin with, and then we all got busy in our own day, day jobs. So my challenge to you is, are you waiting for an invitation, or is there more you could do to play a leadership role in this city? And I hope that you can leave here and reflect on that. I think another thing that we heard about was activation and engagement, and if we think in terms of how can we activate ourselves, how can we get engaged in these conversations, and if you put it slightly differently, how do we align and inspire? So how do we get aligned, and how do we inspire people in this city about our city? So again, thank you to everyone who's been here today. I hope you will join us for drinks and networking in the foyer, and we'll look forward to seeing you all on the 31st of July. Thank you.